Henley was born in Gloucester, England in 1849. At the age of 12, he had to have one of his legs amputated. And they thought they would probably have to take the other leg as well. But at the age of 16, he was able to find a surgeon who could do some, some intricate and demanding surgery on his foot to save him. While he was recovering from that second surgery, he wrote a poem that has become sort of an anthem for people who are going to do life on their own. People who will do life on their own terms. People who will be in control of their life. It was a poem that, that strengthened Nelson Mandela as he languished in prison for years. It's called Invictus. Out of the night that covers me, black as pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horrors of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. I think that this poem could be the, the theme song for the religious leaders of the first century. As they continue to come and confront Jesus, they continue to come and try to trip him up, try to make him fail, try to make him say something that they would catch him and they would be able to defeat him. But every time they left, they left bloodied spiritually. But they continue to come back they continued to say, we will be the captain of our fate. We will be the captains of our soul. As we move into Mark chapter 12 this morning, we're going to see where that leads them. And we're also going to see two people that show up sort of by happenstance that give us an alternative. Because we live in a culture that says, my way is the only way. You can do it your way, that's fine for you, but I'm going to do it my way. What's right for you and good for you does not have to be right for me and good for me. Your truth can be true, and my truth can be true as well. But that's not how God designed this world. Something is either true or it is not. The religious leaders thought they had it all wired. They thought that they understood all that God wanted from them and they did not need to hear anything from Jesus. So turn in Mark cha to Mark chapter 12. It's page 709 if you're using one of the pew Bibles. We'll start in verse 13 today. If you don't happen to own a Bible, please... Take that Bible home with you as our gift. We would love for you to be able to, to reference this as you go throughout your week. Now, the religious leaders, again, in, in chapter 12, confront Jesus. But Jesus, as he always has done and continues to do, even when he hangs on the cross, holds out an olive branch. He wants to reconcile with them. He wants to draw them close to himself. But we see an interesting thing happening in here. If you just read it cursorily in English, you, you would note you would miss it. It says that there are two groups of people that get together here and they come to Jesus, try to trip him up. They're called the Herodians and the uh, Pharisees. Now, these are two people who are, who are at exact opposite uh, pole, uh, uh, ends of the pole of the spectrum. The Herodians believe that a Gentile government was a really great thing. And the Pharisees hated anything to do with Rome. But these people came together because they had a common enemy. And as we experience here even in our culture, a common enemy can create strange bedfellows. Chapter 12, verse 13. 
And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? Their shameless hypocrisy knows no bounds. They call him teacher. But never once have they come to learn from him. Every time they come is to trap him. Every time they come is to see if they can trip him up in some sort of way. They didn't come to, to learn. They didn't come to discuss. They didn't come to have a discourse. In their minds, Jesus was no teacher. They were flattering him. They were trying to set him up, to butter him up, so that he would put his guard down and they could catch him. They say, you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. It's really interesting here. They're, they ask him about the tax. Should we pay this tax to Caesar? Literally, this phrase, you are not swayed by appearances, uh, is translated, you do not see the face of man. Well, what's he saying there? Well, in just a moment, Jesus is going to point them back to the coin that they talked about. He's going to point to an image on that coin. And he's going to teach them and us one of the most incredible, important lessons that we could ever learn about the face that he really sees, about the image that he truly sees. So they flatter him some more and they say, but in truth, you teach the way of God. But Jesus sees behind the hypocrisy. He sees the phoniness. And he sees that they really don't want to hear what he has to say. And yet he continues to push forward. Rather than falling for their trap, Jesus reveals to them a truth that they have been avoiding all along. Just as people should return to Caesar what is his, so they should return to God what is God's. So he says in verse 15, knowing their hypocrisy, he said, why do you put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought one. He said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's, God, and they marveled at him. So this might have been a coin like the one that that they showed Jesus. Whose picture is that? Anybody tell me? Anybody know? Caesar's, right? And Caesar, the, 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 the basis for this coin to have any sort of, of value with the image of Caesar on it, it's backed up by the nation of Rome. Now look at this vast display of Rome's power and might. Everything you see, Rome was in control of. Rome was empowered to back up that coin, to back up that image. And, and here's a picture of the guy behind it all, Caesar Augustus. Now, let me show you another coin. Who's that? Uh, well, a couple of you think you know. George Washington, right? Now, what nation backs up the image that's on that coin? What nation gives it value? The United States. Some would say the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. I don't know if that's true or not, but I like to think it is. And so George Washington is the guy that we know about, and 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 He's the one who sort of is the icon that represents our country. Now, there's a couple more I want to show you. Somebody tell me who, what country this represents. Bolivia. Thank you. I was hoping there'd be some folks in, in here. Now, the picture on there, can somebody tell me? Uh, there's the Bolivia. Go to the next one. Can somebody tell me anything about him? Eduardo Abo, Ab, Abo, oh. Abaroa. There we go. Abaroa. Sorry. Thank you about, sorry about that. He was a hero 
of the uh, the War of the Pacific. And so his image is imprinted on there to make sure that everybody understands that this is one of our war heroes. This is someone that's valuable to us. But the image is what's important because it represents the entire nation. And it, and it tells us that the authority behind that coin is the nation. The question we have to ask as we look at these is as you look at the image that's, that's stamped on that coin, what's the authority behind it? Who owns the coin? One more. Somebody tell me what country this is from. This is uh, from Thailand, from Thailand. And the image on there is, is uh, the, the ninth king in the Roma line. It is Pumepona Dunyade. He died in 2016. But he is, he is someone that they revere and that they, they love enough as a, as a king to put him on their coin. But what's behind that image is the power and the might of Thailand. Now, whose image is stamped on these? Go ahead and scroll through these. Whose image is stamped on those? So when you look at a coin and you see an image that's stamped on there, it's owned by that nation. And when you look at a human being, the image that is stamped on that human being is God's. So the question we have to ask is, who owns what the Herodians and the Pharisees and all the other religious leaders were missing. They thought that they could, could do things their way and make God want them or make themselves worthy of who God is. And God was saying to them, Jesus said to them, render to Caesar what's Caesar's. Render to God what's God's. God doesn't doesn't need our money because he owns us and if someone owns you they own everything about you that's the point we need to understand that that we don't just when we give an offering we don't give because we want to make god feel good about us or we want to feel good about ourselves whatever that offering is whether it's our time whether it's investing our talent in some way, whether it's giving some money. It's because we understand that God owns us. And God has some things that he wants to do in us and through us. Augustine, a, a, a saint who lived hundreds of years ago, when he commented on this passage, I think understood this more clearly than, than most when he said this. We are God's money. We are like coins that have wandered away from the treasury. What once was stamped, stamped upon us has been worn down by our wandering. The one who restamps his image upon us is the one who first formed us. He himself seeks his own coin as Caesar sought his coin. It is in this sense that Jesus says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. To Caesar, his coins. To God, your very selves. God owns every one. He is our absolute authority. And he requires that we return to him what is his. So the rest of this passage that we will fly through shows us how someone who gives themselves back to God behaves. Or another way to say it. When we come to faith and trust in Jesus and we begin that journey of growing to become more like him and gradually learning to give ourselves back to God, he changes.
changes us, transforms us, makes us more and more like Christ. And Jesus kind of gives a precursor of what that's going to look like in this passage. So buckle up. The religious leaders still did not know when they had had enough. They sent another delegate to try and trip Jesus up. This time, it's the Sadducees. The Sadducees are best known for not believing in the resurrection. That's why they're sad, you see. I know, it's really lame. And every time I went over my message, I swore I wouldn't say that. But there we go. Sorry. Verse 18. Sadducees came to him who say there's no resurrection. They asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man, uh, man's brother dies and leaves a wife, but has no child, that man must take the widow and raise offspring to his brother. There were seven brothers, and then he goes through this, they, they, they have this big old long thing, and every one of the seven brothers end up marrying this lady, and not one of them has a child. And so at the very end it says, Last of all, the woman also dies. This is verse uh, 22. In the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had had her as a wife. Um, the Sadducees, they, they thought they, they laid out this great argument. They thought nobody has an answer to this because they'd been fighting back and forth about this for years. No one had a great answer for it. They get hung on their own rope. Look at how Jesus handles it in verse 24. Jesus said to them, Is, not, is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. So what happens here is, is the very conundrum that they weave for themselves, the answer for that conundrum is right there in, in this, this law that Moses gave them. It's called leveret marriage. If a brother's brother dies and he doesn't have any children he's supposed to marry the brother's wife so that they could raise up a child so that brother's name could continue on what they didn't realize was that when the covenant of marriage when somebody dies the covenant of marriage is broken so that 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 person is it's null and void the covenant's null and void and they are free to marry somebody else if not they would be committing adultery so what they didn't realize is that when there's a death, the covenant of marriage is null and void. There is no covenant of marriage any longer. So that when we die and we are in God's presence, Jesus says there is no more marriage. There is no more giving in marriage. There is, there is nothing that we need to, to, to fight about when it comes to that sort of thing. They misunderstood completely the nature of marriage. Marriage is one of God's greatest discipleship tools to help both partners become more like Christ. Marriage is the way that God has given us on earth to experience intimacy on a depth and on a level that our human minds have a hard time comprehending. But it's just a small taste of the intimacy that we will all enjoy with God throughout all of eternity. It is to whet our appetites for intimacy with God. That is what marriage is all about. But the covenant of marriage does not go on into eternity. They've also constructed a theological house of cards. In verse 26 we read, As for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. So, here's a simple question. Are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob dead? Both answers are right. Yes, they're dead. Yes, you can go to their tomb. But we, we think of death as a ceasing to exist. We think of death as your body goes into the ground and that's it. But that's not the biblical picture of death. Death is not a ceasing to exist. Death is a separation. So 
so what happens when you die when I die we are separated us the real us is separated from our bodies and being separated from our bodies we are separated from every other physical being that you know and that I know that according to the Bible is called the first death and what happens when we die that first time if we are followers of Jesus is we spend we, we move from our bodies to be with Jesus Paul says it this way we are confident I say and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord the King James translates it this way and this is the phrase you may remember to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord that's the first first death it's a physical death every one of us unless Jesus comes back to take us home before we die every one of us will experience the first death but it is not a ceasing to exist it is a separation your body and and the, the immaterial part of that's you that's tr the true you will separate but even though our bodies are dead our spirit and our immaterial part of us lives on now when the scriptures talk about a first death it makes you wonder is there a second death and there is and this is the one we want to avoid it's where our spirit the true us is separated from God himself and we are separated from every other follower of Jesus revelation says it this way then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it from his presence earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them and I saw the dead great and small standing before the throne and the books were open then another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done and the sea gave up the dead who were in it death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them and they were judged each one of them according to what they had done then death and Hades were thrown into the lake this is the second death the lake of fire and if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life he was thrown into the lake of fire that's the second death everyone will die be separated from our bodies but only those who come to know Jesus by faith will escape the second death because when I give my life to him I recognize the stamp of his image in me and I give myself back to him the very first thing he does is he makes me alive he makes me alive the Spirit of God comes to live inside of me and makes me someone that I could never be in my own strength. The religious crowd was not done grilling Jesus yet, but this time it's a man who is not part of the charade. He happens to be walking by and he hears the conversation between Jesus and the scribes. And he recognizes that the things that are coming out of Jesus' mouth are very and insightful and it stirs his mind and so he comes to Jesus he comes in to, to the conversation and he asks Jesus a question verse 28 one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another and seeing that he'd answered them well he asked them he asked him which commandment is the most important of all Jesus answered the most important is hear O Israel the Lord our God the Lord is one and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There are no other greater commandments than these. See, the scribes had determined that there were 613 commands in the law that the Jews were supposed to obey. 365 of those commands were negative, and then, uh, so that leaves 248 that were positive. And they love to do nothing but sit around and, and debate and discuss which one is the most important. Can you imagine some of those mind-numbing conversations? Jesus' clear and succinct answer captivated the heart of this man. He saw clearly. And listen to his response, verse 32. The scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him and to love him with all the heart with all the understanding with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices everything of the Old Testament is summarized in those two simple things 
love God and love others. Love God and love others. Interesting thing to me as I look at this man and the, the people who started this conversation off, the Herodians and the Pharisees, they use the same phrase. This guy says, teacher, in truth, you said. But what's the difference? The difference is the first group that came to him did not have any care about what Jesus might say. They didn't come to learn from him. This man came with an open mind and an open heart. And the outcome for him was much different. Verse 34, Jesus says, you are not far from the kingdom. When Jesus makes me alive, I will not only give myself back to him, I will not only love him with everything I have, but I will also love others. I will care for others. It's interesting, he asks him what's the greatest commandment, he says, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's two commands, right? But one flows naturally out of the other. If you love God, you will love others because God so loved that he did what? He gave for the benefit of others. John said it this way, we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, let that sink in. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. He's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Having been made alive, by Christ. Our hearts swell with love for him. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Yes, he is. And that should flow from our lives into the lives of others. Now, does that mean if you're struggling with somebody right now that you're not a follower of Jesus, that you're not saved, that you're in, you should be insecure? No. It means that you're still growing. Whenever God tells us something, he wants us to do something, you can't command love. I cannot walk up to Lois and say, Lois, you'll love me. I can't do that. I can't even walk up to my wife, Connie, and say, you're going to love me. That's something she has to choose to, to give. So when God commands us to love, he's not, he's not pointing his finger at you. He's reminding us of what he did for us. And he's saying, do you understand the depth of my love for you? Do you understand the sinfulness that I had to overcome in your life? And if you can't forgive someone else, come to me and I will help you. He doesn't leave us twisting in the wind. He comes alongside us and he helps us and he strengthens us and he encourages us. This is the way Paul said it. Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are all summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's all of it. When I give myself back to God, I love him with everything I have, and I love others as I love myself. After fielding a bunch of questions, Jesus has one of his own. Verse 35. And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, how can the scribes say that Christ is the son of David? David himself and the Holy Spirit declared, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So how is he his son? And the great throng, throng heard him gladly. So what, what he's talking about there is God had promised all the way throughout the Old Testament. You can read in Psalm 89, you can read in 2 Samuel 7, you can read all throughout the Old Testament that God promised that, that there would always be a king to sit on David's line. David's, David's throne, his line would never go away. And what
what they really were thinking was was what that meant was there it would be this this person that would come after David but David would always be the big guy David would always be the one that were they were pointed to this is David's son uh, 2 Samuel 7:16 says in your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me your throne shall be established forever the religious leaders taught that that the messiah was David's son the people remember the triumphal entry back in chapter 11 what did they do they cried out Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. They all thought that this, this earthly king would come and be in the line of David, but David understood. It says, inspired by the Spirit. The Spirit helped him see something he couldn't see on his own. And instead of calling him my son, David called him Lord. So when, when we acknowledge the image of God in us and we give ourselves back to him, we also acknowledge him as Lord. He makes us alive. We love him with everything we have. We love others as ourselves, and we acknowledge him as Lord. There's kind of a big debate going on in the, in the church. Can Jesus be Savior if he's not Lord? Does he have to be Lord first? When we come to Christ, do we know all the sin that's deep in our hearts? No. God has to take a lifetime to reveal some of that stuff to us. That's why he says in, in 2 Corinthians 3.18 that we become like Christ as we move from glory to glory. In other words, we reflect him this much, a 40-watt bulb, and then a 60-watt bulb, and then a 100-watt bulb, and then a a grow light and it gets brighter and brighter as we go along not because we were lost 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 and finally saved he saves us back here to make us like christ that's why we have a lifetime to do it it's a process the 64 dollar theological word is sanctification and we become more and more and more like then Jesus ends this section of Scripture with, with two contrasting examples. The one example is, again, of the religious leaders. And he says in verse 38, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplace and have the best seats in the synagogues and the place of honor at feast, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive greater condemnation. You have some, the religious leaders that we've been talking about and seeing in this passage, who, who really make a show of their religion. They really are not bowing themselves to Jesus. They're not, they're not really seeing the image of God in them. They're, they're taking this, this religious authority and power by the throat, and they're pretending they're one thing when on the inside they're so, something completely different. It's intriguing to me that it says that they devour widows' houses and for a pretense they make long prayers. Because the next example is of a widow. And you know her story. Jesus and the disciples are sitting across from where they gave all their money and a bunch of wealthy people went up and, and they had these uh, kind of trumpet-looking things that kind of uh, were, were twisted and they would throw the coins in, and it would clank, 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 clank. And the more money you had, the more you would throw in there, the louder it would be. And so you see all these people walking by, clank, 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 clank. You know, maybe we should set some of those horns up here. No. And then all of a sudden, this, this elderly lady, she comes with her walker, making her way up there. And everybody stopped. The line is going slow. Wealthy people are behind her wanting to put their stuff in. She goes up there, and, and it's all this build up, and it's not like clank, 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 it's tink. She throws in two, two pennies. But Jesus says she gave more than the others. What they gave added up to a whole lot more, but Jesus wasn't looking at how much they gave. He was
was looking at how much she had left over. And I think it's intriguing that it, he talks about how these, these, um, these religious leaders um, devour widows' houses. And I kind of wonder if this lady wasn't one of their victims. And she came, having just come from court, and she has nothing. And the only reason she has these two little pennies is because they didn't want to soil themselves and put their hand in her pocket to get it. So she walks up and she ain't. And Jesus says, that lady gets it. What is she saying? God, I'm all yours. I understand that everything that I have has been given to me by you. I'm not going to get angry and bitter at them for taking what I have. I'm going to trust you. So when we give ourselves back to God, we entrust ourselves completely to him. So since you bear God's image and I bear God's image, we rightfully belong to him. And when we give ourselves back to him, he makes us alive. And when we realize what he's done for us, our hearts swell with love and joy. And we can't help but share that with other people. And as we do that, we are acknowledging him as Lord. And we're saying, I don't feel like loving that person but if you'll help me I'll do it and then we entrust ourselves completely to him there's a, a group that just refers to themselves as every home for Christ they wrote sort of their own invictus but it was because they understood that the image of God was stamped deeply into their souls Listen to the difference. We are messengers of hope to a broken world. Our skin is black, white, and every shade in between. Our tongues speak the language of a thousand homelands. Our feet walk deserts, climb mountains, and cross tundra, all to reach one place. It's the place at the heart of every people and nation, the place where people laugh and cry and spend their days. In a word, home. We believe that the Great Commission is for all of us. We believe that prayer changes everything. We lose sleep over the lost and celebrate with the one that returns. Some of us influence leaders, while others are beaten and thrown into prison. Together, whether we live or die, we look to the coming day when a thunderous crowd from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation will worship Jesus. We won't stop until every home is reached and every ear has heard his wonderful name because Jesus is worthy. They get it. They bear God's image and have one growing desire. Give themselves back to God. That's really the only response we can have when we understand this, is to give ourselves back to God. Last week, we had a, a family worship experience together. Our kids were all in service with us. We ended the whole service with singing a song everybody knows, Jesus Loves Me. Now, we sang three verses. You might have known the first verse, and the second two might have been a little less familiar. Well, one of our teachers of our children, Connie Martin, told me this last week that there's another verse, sort of a response, that they sing oftentimes with our kids. And I thought, we need to sing this song to that same tune. It goes, I love Jesus, does he know? Have I ever told him so? Jesus likes to hear me say that I love him every day. Yes, I love Jesus. Yes, I love Jesus. Yes, I love Jesus. In prayer, I tell him so. I kind of thought about that. And that last line, in prayer I tell him so, is sort of a safe line. I have a challenge for you. You may not have time to write this whole thing down, but you can remember that last phrase that's repeated, yes, I love Jesus, yes, I love Jesus, yes, I love Jesus. And what if you changed the ending every day this week? Maybe one day, the first day of it could be, by giving my life to him, I'll tell him so. What if you're going into a meeting? Maybe it's with 
someone that you struggle with. Maybe you could end that day with, I'll love them because Jesus told me so. What will your Invictus be this week? How will you give your life back to him? Would you sing this with me?